You are watching the Pan African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. So, um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Jambo, jambo, jambo. Kariboni. Welcome to all Pan African Daily TV followers and fans across the continent and beyond means we're talking about the diaspora i hope all of you are doing well out there it's been a while um <laughs> that we have come a little bit closer again right so today we are live 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 on the pan-african daily tv it means we can take your questions we can take calls yes i mean so but today um as i told you for those that have been missing the pan-african daily we have a very exclusive guest this guest is the first yeah that's why she's sitting right here and that's why i was talking about the past and that's why i'm talking about our new followers who are new to the pan-african daily even the old ones must have forgotten her face but she was the new female voice and the young one on the Pan-African Daily TV. Even before we had um, Her Excellency Dr. Arikana, who became then the mother, first voice of the Pan-African Daily TV, particularly on YouTube when we launched last year, Neriko Wako Ojewa was here and she talked about the, the need for the young women to get politically involved in the uh, development of Africa, particularly, you know, on issues that are related to administration, leadership, good governance, and the relevance uh, for our development. So she is not here for the first time. We're going to be touch base with all our early comers. The first uh, conversations that we had with them were very, very uh, influential. And that was the spark of the Pan-African Daily TV. Now, we brought her here today because um, we want to talk about this issue of presidents, particularly African presidents in most of African countries that keep using their, their, their political status, you know, their office to manipulate or to amend constitutions, be it in favor of the general country or the, the government or in favor of themselves. Now, we've been having a lot of challenges in most African countries, you know, presidents just change constitutions like they're going you know, for a walk in the park, you know, anything that doesn't favor them, if they have to rule uh, for a limited time period and they say, oh, no, we have not uh, 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 finished with our work. So they would have to, you know, use their authority in, in as a leader, as a president of a government, you know, to, to amend this constitution. And so we've been seeing it a lot. And, uh, and, and, and the issue actually is, yes, of course, the amendment of this constitution, but another very critical point is the fact that it is not even in accordance with, with the parliament. Like you just say, I'm the boss here, who are you to say something? And so they keep doing this game over and over. So today, we had a very, uh, or in the past, uh, we've been following on a, a particular case in Kenya, the BBI, the BBI it is something relevant in what we're talking about, uh, the constitution uh, from the leadership and the government or the president or whatever, uh, um, to influence, I don't know, whatever policies. And that's why we have a special, exclusive young voice here, the CEO of what is called CS Plus, um, a platform for young Kenyans uh, that have political aspirations and the development of the Africa that we want. She's sitting right here and she will be explaining to us what actually happened in 
Kenya that we saw even the judiciary, the court took this case to court and they dismissed that BBI issue. But we don't know how Kenyans are reacting. We saw them jubilating. We saw some of them not really in favor. Or so the, so the, the opinions were actually different. That's why we thought we should make this a topic because it's not only in Kenya, it is happening and it's a big challenge on the continent, what is the solution? After the conversations, we're gonna open lines for you to make calls and, and, and give your comments or your recommendations. What is it that we need to be paying attention? How can we you know, overcome this challenge? Particularly taking into consideration the aspirations of young Kenyans that took it, not lying down. So thank you very much. I hope all of us are seated now while Patrick is already connected and he's saying now we can go back to studio. Back to the studio with our guest. Hello, hello, hello. Nerima, how are you? I'm fine, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> it's been a wonderful long while. I mean, you were sitting here on this same position on the Pan-African Daily TV last year and now uh, after a while we haven't seen you we thought it was necessary for our new followers and for the whole pan african daily tv family to get to know this special woman you know that is making a big big move there on the continent of africa in kenya so what have you been doing ever since uh, you left the pan african daily tv well um a lot has happened in one year um my organization still does the same work with working with young people but mm -hmm. of course we're going to talk about how a lot of things have changed because of covid uh mm -hmm. you can see a lot of governments are using it as an advantage to pass particular laws and very unconstitutional movements but mm -hmm. i've also uh, grown in terms of a family i now have a son uh, he's nine months now. Oh, so, yeah. So that's been interesting. So a lot of people always make fun of me and they say, "Oh, you had a COVID baby," and I'm like, "Yes, he was born in 2020, so we will never forget this year." And um, other than that, I've been good. I cannot complain. I feel blessed, and it's so mm. good to see you as well, and to see how your platform has grown. Of course, it is the pat platform that you you officially inaugurated, particularly as a female young activist in the political arena. We are also thankful because it was like you opened the door and you blessed it. And so the spirit that you brought on the platform could not have been different and your wishes and your ambitions. Can you still remember what, what you said when you were here last time about what you expect Africans to be doing, particularly in terms of their mindset? that the Africa that we want. And that's exactly what you're calling your organization, which is fantastic. And going out there and being fearless about it. And it doesn't matter how young you are, you're able to carry that. Exactly, exactly. So um, yes, congratulations, first of all, for, you, for our dear son. I mean, that's really the COVID baby and every baby that came out in 2020 is a freedom fighter, it's a change. Yeah, they bring in new uh, vibes, they bring in a new decade with us. So it is a king and we have to put very, very, all our focus and attention to make sure that we raise him in the way that we would have loved knowing our history, knowing our past and, and taking control of our narratives in every situation, particularly in building the Africa that that we want yes yeah, so how has your organization been doing uh, been doing all this while i mean it being a mother and then running the organization as a ceo can you just tell the audience that haven't known you before what is your organization about sure absolutely so in kenya kiswahili siasa means politics and um, I named my organization politics because of how negatively, especially young Africans view politics. It's either violent or you find politicians bribing you for a vote, so full of corruption. And a lot of times we just engage with them in cycles, so every four years. So we are re-educating the youth that politics is every single day the decisions that representatives make within parliament and mm -hmm. how you can engage with that process and not just during an election, not just voting, but holding mm -hmm. leaders accountable. So we're rebranding uh, the meaning of politics and that's why we found it important to call ourselves Siasa. So we've been engaged uh, throughout the year, even through COVID. I feel that it was one 
moment where we were able to see our strengths because we're so huge on Twitter. Mm -hmm. We're so huge on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok as well. We were still able to interact with young people during this process. As much mm -hmm. as people were doing social distancing, physical engagements were banned at one time, actually several times in Kenya, we were still able to have meetings, um, meeting on Zoom, and even negotiating for pushing for airtime and credit for people who don't have access to the internet, mm -hmm. pushing for young people to get smartphones and buying those smartphones for them so that they can interact and engage with us. Mm -hmm. So I would say that within that process, like I mentioned, a lot of public participation, which in Kenya, the county governments are supposed to be able to come and discuss with the community how they're supposed to use their budgets. So mm -hmm. because of COVID, when people are not meeting physically, a lot of county governments were pushing budgets without the public's approval. So we've seen mm -hmm. a lot of that happen. So we were pushing for government to still have these engagements, even if they are online, and have this information accessible. So we're still pushing for the rights of young people. So what we do is educate youth on the constitution of Kenya, uh, the rights that they have access to, and even those that they feel they are unaware of, we teach them how to advocate for those particular rights. And the real strength is in the budgets, the budgets that our governments are supposed to follow through. Because the public is ignorant or have limited information of just how much money is supposed to go to, say, health, or how much money is supposed to go to agriculture, they're able to steal so much. So what we do is make this information accessible so that they're able to follow up with their particular governors and put pressure on them. So it's been an interesting period, I think. I think we've been able to see a lot of positive impact in <laughs> one particular county where we work. There was absolutely zero budget that went to youth programs. By the mm -hmm. end of the year, we were seeing 30 million shillings. We were seeing it even going to the grassroots, which is village level, ward level. Mm -hmm. They're receiving up to 4 million shillings. So that has been a big, big plus for us. Absolute. Wonderful. So um, it, it means you teach a, a young political aspirants or just general people about the constitution, irrespective of which party, isn't it? Yes. So we teach all public and then we have uh, different levels of engagement. So right mm -hmm. now, because we're entering an election period, we're going to be now focusing on young people who are interested in political seats. But initially, like because of the three year period that we had, we've been teaching the general public on the different avenues and platforms that they can interact with government leaders and mm -hmm. how they as voters can hold those leaders accountable. So it's two pronged. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, this is massive. So um, when you teach them, like you said, okay, you had to influence this uh, budget or the, the parliament or the government uh, to be responsible for its constituency and its co uh, community. So when, uh, I mean, how does the process work like? How did you uh, get the young people to inf influence that bill? Hmm. So the first process is just inviting them to a meeting. We don't say it's political because they're not going to mm -hmm. come. Uh, so a lot of times we would have, even if it's a tournament or even if it's just having youth and inviting them to a public, we call them a baraza, which is just a sit down. And it's a be being able to ask them, what are some of the issues that you feel are important to you right now? And asking them that question. So we invite them through youth groups. So we know that there are a lot of youth groups in the community. Some of them are businessmen and women. Some of them <laughs> work in the market. Some of them are farmers. Some of them are in school. So going to these different groupings and asking them to have 10 of their members coming to our meetings. Now, in that meeting, after we hear from them, we basically hear where some of them will complain about not having access to water, They'll complain about too much corruption or the roads are just too bad or sanitation issues. There's just too much garbage in our neighborhoods. So after hearing from them, we ask them, what's one issue that you feel 
you know, if we were to prioritize them, what would be that one issue that comes up number one? Mm -hmm. And so they inform us. They can say, well, I feel if we had better roads, we might have better jobs because we'd have better access. So it's roads. Mm -hmm. So we say, okay, let's all focus on roads. What can we do about roads? Who can we hold accountable for roads? So now that now becomes the second meeting, teaching them the different representatives that are in charge of roads in their communities or mm. understanding the different de departments that exist. Because a lot of times young people get confused. They see a member of parliament and they'll blame him for everything that's going wrong, but they don't understand that there are different offices that are in charge of particular things. It might be his job to push it in parliament to get more funding, but it's mm. not his overall and only job. So the youth have to be able to understand the different issues that go to the different leaders and the different departments and then how. So after they understand the individual, it's the how. So now we educate them on how to write, say, a formal letter to government. Because mm -hmm. for us, government has to respond to you in two weeks. That's in our law. They have to respond to you. And so even if they don't in two weeks, you can even use that to be able to push this further into a higher level in government. And a lot of them do not like that. County government doesn't like their issues going to someone in national government because they know they're going to get into more trouble. So educating the youth in the importance of formal communication. A lot of us complain online. We will <laughs> vent on Twitter and it'll <laughs> die there. It'll die on Facebook. It'll die there. So educating them on this is how you write a letter. This is how it's a formal documentation. This is the office it has to go to. And as soon as it goes there, you have to receive a stamp. And that stamp says they received that letter and you go with a copy. So youth understanding that process and follow through. A lot of times when government offices see that young people know how to do this stuff, they actually pay attention uh, mm -hmm. because they know they don't want to get in trouble. But mm -hmm. then sometimes they do not listen and they ignore and then we take it a notch higher. So yeah. how do we take it yeah. a notch higher? We advocate. We now teach youth how to mobilize around a particular issue, how to mm -hmm. get community members to be concerned about that issue. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, there was a time that uh, the community was complaining about a sewer line, the sewage that's been open for months. It's a risk, it's a hazard to children because they play near it, they eat it, some of them, and get sick. And people are not able to farm because that material, that waste, has actually made the land around it bare, barren. <laughs> So they can't do any agriculture around there. So they complained, like, why don't they fix this? It's been an issue and we've complained about it and they ignored us. So we decided as our team to have a meeting for the community just near the sewer. And I kid you not, by the end of the meeting, there was a contractor <laughs> already <laughs> on site. <laughs> no. Trying to clear out the mess because it was bringing so much attention. And then it was bringing too much attention. People started filming it on Facebook. Before we know it, the governor is watching our Facebook live. And he's like, what is this? Where are people having a meeting near sewage? Like, you need to fix that. So there are different methods um, that we engage the youth, especially when they feel that they are not seeing the results fast enough, but also to manage expectations because it's a long, long process sometimes. You can be pushing an issue for three, six months, one year, and sometimes you feel that uh, they don't have the energy for it. It takes a lot of passion to do it. No one is paying you to do this. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are like, I have other things to do. I have kids to raise. I have to go and hustle. I, how can I be following up with government? And they need to be doing this on their own. So it takes a lot of encouraging teamwork so a lot of times when we capacity build youth, we capacity build them in partners. So they're always coming in twos. So that if one of them feels like they're worn out and they're burnt out, then they're able to tap to their partner to keep it going. And then once they feel burnt out, they tap back. So we understand the importance of teamwork when it comes to accountability and also security. 
because we've had a lot of you feeling threatened where they'll send us messages this politician thinks that i'm interested in their job and mm. they're just making me you know they feel like i'm highlighting everything bad in the community so that they are not re-elected and so you find a politician now feels threatened by a youth and they start sending goons and thugs to threaten this young person so sometimes i do get phone calls where youth feel that they're not safe they're not safe at home and that mm -hmm. comes from leaders who are insecure they're just not doing their work and they feel that someone is out to get them they feel it's a personal attack when you're just more concerned about them meeting what their job is meeting their standards Excellent, excellent work. I mean, I can imagine. I mean, uh, is the process easy for them when you or, or when you explain, or it takes really a while for them to understand? It's easy once you explain. Mm -hmm. It's easy once you explain because we've had this debate where not everybody has to know the step by step. Because mm -hmm. when you start talking about certain bills that exist, policies that exist, our policies are written in English. Yes. And they are not translated. And you now have to find someone who maybe has a background in university setting and mm -hmm. capacity build them to sort of translate what's happening. So it's always important to identify the leaders and capacity building them. So that's one lesson for me where you cannot educate the entire public on the same level. It's just not possible just because Correct. of the literacy levels. And also sometimes people are not that interested. They just want to see change and they rather support the person pushing for that change in their different ways. For mm -hmm. some, it's to provide food for the person because they can't afford the money. For some, it's just attending the meetings and giving their input. For some, it's the actual engagement with politicians. So they want to attend the meetings. Mm -hmm. Well, for others, they rather be behind the scenes. They financially support the process, but they don't want to be involved in the entire process. So understanding the different strengths of the people involved and how they can sort of plug in is important. But mm -hmm. not everybody has to know the entire process from A to Z. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. I mean, um, but, you know, like a country like Kenya that has Swahili, like the main official language of the continent, even in even. Uh, so the constitution is not translated into Swahili. It's translated into Swahili, um, but it's not distributed in Swahili. It's actually distributed mainly in English. So ah. there have been uh, multiple organizations that have tried to translate not the whole of the document, important articles into Kiswahili, and then some of them have worked on translating it into Sheng. So the mm. informal Kiswahili, the ones that you speak, is what they've tried to circulate. But in the other um, 42 other tribal languages, not really, no. <sighs> Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite challenging. And you see, and that's one of the problems that we keep or the challenge on the continent, the multilingual and even the particular tribal linguals, you know, how are we going to, you know, pass a simple message like the constitution that you're talking about, you need to translate into this different different tribal groups now dear Pan-African Daily TV family, you understand already just the little challenge of in communication to even explain to the young people the process and how the issue of language becomes a barrier it is actually a challenge out there but congratulations to you Nerima I mean and your organization we'll still get back to know more about what you've been doing or the text or even how you even came to create that okay. right. topic for today <laughs> Beautiful. So one last statement. I know you already surprised, uh, summarized everything Patrick Kasarim is saying. Good, 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 good conversation out there. He's also your brother. He's our uh, coordinator, for a country coordinator, a Kenyan, based there in Kenya on the Pan-African Daily. And he said, you summarized everything perfectly. Yeah. And um, yes, how are we going to get you again? How possible is it we would have your availability? I mean, you mustn't say it here. 
I'm flexible. You know, every time you reach out to me, I'm always like, heck yeah. Um, I do believe in supporting because I believe in the cause. And I, like I said, I would love, love, love to interact also with other people who come on your platform as well and to also see how can we also work together and support one another for the greater cause of a better Africa. Beautiful. Wonderful. We're going to make that happen. And like we said, I mean, all the database of everybody that comes here on the platform, whatever or how we now start pairing the continental and the diaspora together to share this perspective. That is one of our greatest initiative networking and connecting the diaspora to mainland. So most who want to relocate or repatriate, fine. Those who just say, yes, I'm comfortable here, like your husband is saying, but then my heart is on the continent in motherland. I don't want to forget. I want to get engaged. I want to give skill knowledge or whatever everything is possible particularly when we have professionals and partners like sia plus there or like queen and Nerima there that is everything you want to know about investment about even the political situation which door you can knock on the continent what kind of contact and information reliable not just information reliable information because there's a lot going out there we'll be breaking some of those stories of even the diasporas that have relocated and they're so disappointed with what or even other diasporas the way they treat them you know and and uh, back on the continent selling land and not providing titles and all the stuff you know one thing to repatriate is another thing but one thing to actually get somebody that is reliable and trustworthy and that could do the job is another one so yes the pan-african daily tv the africa we want organization that is what we do we do due diligence on what kind of partners you're meeting out there so don't just throw your your money here i get about how many complaints on our table here? Oh, Dr. Susan, you know, I went to Ghana, I didn't get my land. I didn't even see the person who collected my money and this and this and that. Before you take those steps, please talk to us. Let us help you do a due diligence on that. And that would be the right thing to do because it's really, really a disgrace. And we're going to be exposing all those things here on the Pan-African Daily. We cannot do that to ourselves. Narema, do you have such an experience? Yes. <laughs> but there's also um i'm wary uh, about how you do things it's so sad that we we have people like that though you know i feel that that's something that needs to change about at home because when you look at our values that's not part of our values that greed yes. uh, and even the corruption uh, but then it's become part of the system and it's unfortunate but i do think that I am very, very wary when it comes to buying land and things like that. I don't. Even just most recently, uh, we were supposed to be putting a borehole in our property. We have a farm, my husband. And so he, because he's not around, he's gone to the States for like three weeks. So he asked me to pay the, the engineer to start the drilling. Mm -hmm. And I did. I did. He directed me to. So I kept waiting for the engineer to tell me when it's done. You know, the engineer didn't even go to the property. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we lost $300 like that. And when I told my husband, he was like, ah, I don't, I'm never going to trust another engineer again. I'm going to pay after they're done now. I'm not going to pay uh, before they start. So things like that happen, but it's not to uh, discourage or get so disappointed. We just laughed about it, honestly. Otherwise, we'll die from stress. <laughs> <laughs> you just get another one. Okay, this time I will go with him to the farm and watch him drill it. Yes. <laughs> and then see him. <laughs> but yeah, Beautiful. it happens. Yeah. And that's also one thing this trust trust among us you know i like my germans who say yes trust is okay but control is much better right <laughs> and i think that's also, also some of the ethics that we'll have to learn to say yes we do trust ourselves we know we are african but it's still some of us it's a natural thing it, it has nothing to do now whether it's a mentality or something thing there's just people that are like that <laughs> 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 but, but that doesn't make us the bad people or whatever thing those are internal things like we say yes we're gonna fix it and uh believe me we are fixing it like i said 
one of the things that we want to do now because of all these complaints and the setbacks that have been coming people that we've recommended or we've been shouting and making some noise here and they're like oh, i want to go back i must just go back and they go they went to the continent and we'll be having that on a topic in this individuals that are concerned why because for us it's a learning process it's a learning process now the first ones that go like the missionaries they get the report on the ground they give it back to us we assess that report we go into the research what went wrong how could we make that better so we are not saying that yes we are now like this we're not going to do it anymore how oh, you see or uh, particularly the, 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 the some or the, the like the diasporas that we're even those are we're struggling to even still convince them um after 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 all the the pain and and the negative narratives that have been infested and they see, see us and like oh wow we never had such information then when they go back and they get this kind of experience come on bro. susan tata what are you making what what are you saying what are you making us to do out there so yes we've been having that kind of setback and please um it should stop we have to stop it. Yes, it's an abuse. And um, why not? As Just like we hold every other institution or issues accountable, that one too would be held accountable. But I like the guys out there who was just saying, you know what, I'm here and I'm staying. And you know what? Even the sister that traveled from here to look for his piece of land, never got it, never met the people that took that land. They were all desperate. And you know what? Went and took them to court. That's the right thing to do. But then let's be careful. Let's check, make a lot of research, who actually we trusting, and then put our partners that are reliable, like Nerima. Nerima, now when we want to start doing our boreholes or getting our contractors, I mean, we'll be getting in touch with you to confirm and, and check that out for us, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> lesson learned. Lesson learned. <laughs> when you learn, then you do better. That's the best thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's fine wow sweetie it's 22 o'clock and we really we slapped the two hours like we did uh even though we started a little bit earlier we're gonna release you uh because we know that our baby boy is waiting right there the king is waiting and it's really actually laid out there so we are happy to have you and we will have you again sometime very soon like you said it's my platform i open it so each time you need me i'll always be there we have to connect more often thank you so much for being here your last word to your audience uh thank you for having me i really enjoyed the conversation today and i love these sort of spaces you feel loved you feel welcomed so always always glad to be part of these conversations Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also for being the voice and particularly the right voice at the right place. And uh, yes, we see yourself some other time. I regard back and tell your husband, August, we're waiting. Let him call us at, at September. Tell us whether he will still make another two weeks out there. All right. All right. Regards to our family out there. We love you so much and we will have to, love to have you again some other time. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye.